AM 1060 WMEL. The views expressed on the following program are those of the hosts, callers, and guests, and are not necessarily those of WMEL staff, management, or advertisers. This is Joe Stacker, folks, your host for Focus on Seniors, the radio arm of Focus on Seniors, one huge, large nonprofit organization. It's really small, but it's large in that it has a radio show, a television show, and print media in Hometown News, Spotlight, Senior Scene, Aldea, and Ebony News. Notice that we cover the black market, the Spanish market, the Caucasian market, the every market. We we're every, we're all over. There used to be a, a, a show out in Hawaii, and uh, we used to listen to it when we were submerged on a submarine. It was, and it was a crazy nut of a, of a broadcaster. And he, he came out with, he said, they're everywhere, they're everywhere, they're everywhere. And it was sort of a theme song he did. I'll have to try to remember. Maybe if I get a recording, we'll play it sometime. It was cra- kind of crazy because people got really got in tune with it. And it's just like anything. If you feel like you're getting good information, if you enjoy listening to something, if somebody is helping you understand something, then you should listen to them because that's the way we learn. And that's the purpose of Focus on Seniors and Helping Seniors. We educate, inform, and connect seniors and people that care for seniors to resources. Kay Kaiser, our information specialist, her phone number is 473-7770. Call her. She'll talk to you. And, folks, uh, I could tell you all kinds of stories, and we're getting ready to do some uh, tapes and new shows next week over at uh, uh, at the Braswell Courtney offices of uh, financial advisors on US One, or let us use their uh, conference room to do some taping. But one of the shows we're going to tape will talk about why people need to know how to access information. It's extremely important. The sponsors for this part of the show include Gentiva Home Healthcare, the I Institute, Solid Bite Dental Implants. Bill Johnson, Elder Law Attorney, he's my panelist today. WMAL AM 1060, this radio station, Wistoff Hospital Systems, Love and Home Care, Atlantic Shores Rehab, and Ebony News Today. And since we're just about to, to close out 2015 and start 2016, folks, I did a show years ago, Bill, I was probably seven or eight years ago, and we talked, Bill, at that time about closing a year and opening a new year. And uh, I went back and I I pulled some questions off that I asked you seven or eight years ago about what what good elder law attorneys do and what to think about and what they should cause uh, potential clients to think about. And that's, that's the topic for today. I, I called it closing out a legal year. And the first question, well, welcome, Bill. <laughs> Good afternoon, Joe. <laughs> Good afternoon. After all my after all my talk, I finally welcome Bill Folks. I promise to let him talk a bit more. But uh, what are some of the th- common concerns, Bill, that people really should have at the end of the year? And one of the things that uh, I know you and I have talked about over the over the over the years has been access to our documents, how important it is. Why should people be thinking about access to their documents? Well, usually this time of year is when family members come to visit, either Thanksgiving or Christmas, and they uh, visit with their family. And uh, a lot of times they discover their family members are not doing as well as they thought they were doing, uh, you know, either mentally or physically. And subsequently, um, it may be necessary to, you know, have a power of attorney or a health care surrogate or even a will or a trust available uh, at, you know, arm's length. Well, you make the point. We make an assumption that these documents are all in place. They might well be in place, but if they're not where you are or if you don't know how, how to get to them, there's a bigger problem. Correct. 
and a lot of time people don't know where their originals are. They have a whole bunch of copies of stuff, and you know they don't realize that the attorney up in New York who prepared their will never gave them the original. And How important is that? Uh, it's pretty important. You should always have the uh, original of your documents uh, because it's a lot harder to introduce a will into probate if you only have a copy. But do a lot of people, let's say, in your business, if you prepare a trust for somebody, do you keep the original in, of the document or do you give that back I to I give the originals to the clients. You do? Yes. But you keep a copy of everything in your Correct. storage files? Correct. I never thought about that. That's a question we've never really talked about. Yeah, I I keep a copy of everything we've done. So all the way back till I opened my practice, Is that, <laughs> I got a storage well, unit full of where stuff. Where do you store all this stuff? Oh, we got two storage units that we put a lot of it in. I know you just recently moved. By the way, what is your new office location number? I don't even know it. We're at 140 Interlocking Road, Suite B, Melbourne, Florida, 32940. Is that in Viera? Uh, it's in Sun Tree. Sun Tree. The Sun, Sun Tree. Tree area. Okay. All right. Well, you know, having access to the documents is one thing. Something came up in a discussion with a, with someone last week, and I had my eyes open to the fact that, uh, you know, when a death occurs, most of us assume that... Uh, or think that people have access to funds, access to checkbooks, that uh, there's no problem. However, that's not true. No, that's not true. Can you, and here's the question I had for Bill, folks. I said, access to cash in event of a death. And that brings into mind some of the good points and the bad points of joint ownership. Well, it, it does, because if you have a joint owner on the account, one of the account owners passes, the surviving account owner can access the account. But you could also make the account payable on death to someone, like your kids, so that when you pass, the monies would automatically transfer to the kids. The latter is probably more preferable to the former, because... If you have a joint account and one of you gets sued, divorced, or something like that, your funds may be uh, frozen or accessed to pay a judgment. Well, this person, it was just, a, it was just I want to say, plain old death. One of the, one, uh, the husband died. And, and everything he had, uh, everything they had, the car, the house, was in his name. Not, not joint ownership. They didn't know about doing what you're just talking about. So she didn't have access to cash. Yeah, if you're married, uh, typically you have everything as husband and wife. Uh, but if you had everything in just one name, uh, when the first spouse died, and if that was the one that everything's name was on, then you're doing a probate to get it over to the surviving spouse. But this is this is the type of thing that I think that in fact, do you in all the seminars that you do, do you talk about the types of things that we're talking about right now in seminars? Are yeah, I, I do an estate planning seminar every month uh, at one senior place, and we talk about all these different issues, joint ownership versus putting a beneficiary designation versus having your assets in a trust versus having to go through probate. But I will bet my bottom dollar that there is still more of a problem regarding what we're talking about today than, than people even want to think about. Correct. Usually uh, when I do my seminar afterwards, everybody goes, wow, we never thought of it that way. You know, because uh, you never really s sit down and, and, you know, the question on everybody's mind is if I die – how do my assets pass and to whom? 
That's the, the who gets my stuff, <laughs> you know, right. yeah. and that's the question that you really want answered. If I was to die tomorrow, who would get my stuff? And uh, most people haven't really considered that some of your stuff may pass by a will. Some of your stuff may pass by virtue of a beneficiary designation. Some of your stuff may pass by virtue of being jointly owned with somebody. So there's a lot of different ways assets could pass on. So in a, in a, in a state like Florida, with so many senior citizens living here, and there are numerous second and third marriages. Correct. So, and we have talked about this on numerous radio shows and television shows over there. And we've got a couple of TV shows on our archived on our website that deal specifically with what Bill and I are talking about. If you want to go to helpingseniorsofbrevard.org, you can pull a couple of those shows up, folks, and you you can refresh your memory. But this is one of the things that I wanted to try to home in on today, Bill, being at the end of the year. That, and, and you brought the point out when people do come to visit, it never hurts to sit down and take a look at documents that, that we don't want to talk about, that we think are already that people understand, many times don't understand. And by talking about these things, you know, it just sort of brings to mind there are so many things we could do to make life easier for survivors true uh, and uh, it's worth sitting down with somebody who does estate planning to discover what those you know options are yeah and let's say if you had if you have a, what we're talking about now if you had a, a scheduling appointment for somebody how long would it really take for you to sit down and go over all this stuff with somebody with a husband and wife? Yeah, usually I set an hour appointment when I first meet with somebody. But it doesn't usually take an hour. So, to me, that's money well spent. Right. And we do free consultation, so. And you do a free consultation to tell them they need to do this. Correct. So, if they do this, one thing, they they may spend, I don't know what your hourly fee is, I don't know, I'm not going to ask that. But, let's just say, they may spend three hundred dollars with you to find out what they need to do, and if they don't do that, and one of them passes, and they have to go into a guardianship, they have to go into all kinds of stuff. They could spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to do what three hundred dollars might have accomplished. Correct. And that's I don't. I, it wouldn't I, be a guardianship; it would be a probate. Probate. Okay, but. So sometimes it does lead to a guardianship. Well, if it, not in the event of death, if somebody passes, there's not a guardianship. But if somebody is incapacitated, then there could be a guardianship. Yeah, if 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 the part if, if the well partner passes and the other partner has got problems and they haven't provided for that, you got the children get involved and they don't like what's happening or one, one of the children doesn't like what the other was doing, you end up in a contested will or a contested something and you end up with guardianship. Yeah, you could end up spending many thousands in a contested guardianship. So why not? Why not take the time sometime, folks, and go to a simple one-hour presentation that can help you understand what you don't know? It just it it boggles my mind that people don't do this. But I'm not surprised, Bill. Well, you you really have to get out there and educate yourself. You said it right. I didn't say it. You have to educate yourself. Right. We we can we can you know sticking your head in the sand, uh, thinking that day is never going to come, is what usually leads to disaster. It is, and and you know. If people will just go to that site I just mentioned, Helping Seniors of Brevard, all one word, folks, helpingseniorsofbrevard.org. Pull up the website, look at the information that's there, spend 10 or 15 minutes surfing that site, and see the titles of some of the TV shows that are archived there. And, you know, what it should do is whet your appetite for more knowledge. You know, if if it was my money, 
my home, my possessions, and things I collected over the years, I'd want to make sure they got to where I want them to get, Bill. Correct. And, you know, the uh, obviously it's not going to affect you because you're gone. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, but it does affect your loved ones. You know, often well, you bring up a good point. I've always <clears throat> wondered when a person dies what they're able to see from the other side, but all the squabbling and everything else that does, it can and will sometimes go on when people pass. I just wish I knew what I would see. Hopefully nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree the same way. Let's see a couple other things here. When we're talking about common concerns at the end of the year, we're talking about access to documents, access to cash. Documents you always need to have in place, always. What are the documents that our listeners always need to have in place? I think you, at a minimum, need a will. Okay. And you should also have a durable power of attorney. Why? Why a durable power? Well, that means that the power of attorney will survive your incapacity. Right. And then what that does is allow somebody to manage your financial affairs if you become incapacitated. And then you should have a designation of health care surrogate, which is basically the same concept except it is managing your health care affairs. And then you, at a minimum, should have a living will. That's your end-of-life wishes. Now, where should those documents be located? Well, somewhere where somebody can get at them. (laughs) So if you have them in a safe deposit box, make sure you have somebody else's name on there so they can access that box in the event you become incapacitated or pass on. Or, you know, in a uh, some sort of fireproof safe at home. But, again, you have to make sure somebody can access that. And they have to know where it is. It's just like I've told, Correct. I've told our oldest son. I said, Steve, if something happens to me, all the papers, the trust, everything else is in this one place. It's all right there. And I try to keep it straightened up. Sometimes I get behind, but... It wouldn't be that difficult for him to untangle what's in there because it's all the pertinent stuff that he would need to know as the executor of the will. Well, let's talk about that because if you were to pass away, not only is he going to need your documents, but he's going to need to know about your life insurance, your investments, your bank accounts, your health insurance, your vehicle titles, the deed to the house. Uh, you know, a laundry list of where all your assets are because he's not going to have that knowledge that you have of where you have your monies. So you've got to not only leave the documents there, you got to leave some sort of roadmap. You know, here here's the document and here are all the accounts that go along with, you know, my life. Picking up on what Bill just said, folks, and I want to Bill to talk about this. We bring families together at Christmas time, and we have so many second and third marriages uh, for any number of reasons. But designation of beneficiaries is extremely important, and it's probably something that we have so many various documents a person might often forget to change to beneficiary. And that's extremely important, isn't it, Bill? Correct, because what when somebody passes, you know that asset's going to pass to that beneficiary, and it may not be enough that you changed your will, uh, but you also need to make sure that all your beneficiary designations are in accordance with your wishes. So that's, you know, we gather at the holiday season for joyous reasons, but. There are also practical reasons that need to be discussed when families get together. And and I, I, I did leave one off the list, too, is if you have any sort of prepaid burial or funeral arrangements, those probably need to be in there as well. Yeah. Where do you I, – I, I know the answer to this question, but I, where do you go to get a list of all this stuff that you should be 
Um, I have, when, for my clients, if they want, I have some sort of organizer that helps them put all these things together. Um, I know a lot of the funeral homes, when they do their presentations, they give out organizers. You can also buy books in any of the bookstores that help you organize all these things. Uh, and, you know, may ask you even more in-depth questions like, you know, a list of your relatives. Who do you want notified? Where to find all these people? I'm glad you, you said know, that. You know, the yeah. addresses and... I've got one of those things. I've got to fill it out. Yeah, I once had a guy who, who passed away and he had a will and he left like everything to 20-something people. But he didn't give us any contact information. And it was a nightmare trying to, you had to contact, trying, you know, sort through and get one of them. And then you would ask that person, did they know any of these other people? And it took quite a while to actually get in contact with everybody that was listed as a beneficiary. When that happens, does your office staff do that or do you have a service that? It depends. Sometimes we do it. Sometimes the person who's appointed as the personal representative that's the executor. Uh, sometimes that's their job. Yeah. You know, dying in many respects is, it's, it's, it's not, I, I don't know, I've never experienced it. I don't know if it's easy or hard to die. I I'm not ready to find out yet. However, um, be that as it may, um, there's no real simple solution to what we're talking about, is there? No, you have you know you should be organized. Otherwise, That's, you're just transferring the burden onto your loved ones. Organization is the key word. Correct. Along with, along with that, we're getting this thing that we're going to, have to take a mid-show break in just a second. But folks, we got a couple of things we want to talk about on the other side. So do stay with us because I uh, got a couple of things that uh, you need to think about as we're going to be electing a new president. And it's extremely important for us, especially our seniors. So stay with us. You'll want to find out what I'm going to set soon. Be back in about uh, two and a half minutes. AM 1060 WMEL. This is Joe Snecker, folks. We're back live for the second half of the show. Um, remember, that phone number for KOT office is 473-7770. The purpose of helping seniors is to educate, inform, and connect seniors and those that care for seniors to resources. And the sponsors that help us uh, provide the second part of the show include Senior Scene Magazine, Hometown News, Spotlight Magazine, Seniors Helping Seniors, The Fountains of Melbourne, Beth Courtney of the Braswell Courtney Financial Team, Canadian Meds of Melbourne, Wiederman Malik Attorneys, Vitas Hospice, and Peaceful Beach Mediation with Attorney Brooke Goldfarb. Those are the media sponsors. We have a, we're putting together what we call now a provider network, folks. We've got, we've got so many requests for people that, that need a handyman. They need roofing services. They need electricians. They need all kinds of things. And when they go to the phone book, they don't know who to call. They don't know who to trust. So um, we're working about, there are four or five of us are trying to contact all different kinds of businesses. And we'll put this provider list together. When, so if you call Kay and you say, I need a roofer, Kay will be able to tell you a couple of, of roofers that you could call with an expectation that you'll be treated fairly. Uh, we're not. We, we're going to ask the people in this uh, network to sign what we call an ethics statement, and so that we want to talk to them and make sure that they understand that they're going to be serving seniors. They got to be trustworthy because uh, a lot of the seniors are vulnerable, live alone, and they simply don't really know how to take care of some of these things. So that's one of the things that we. We hope to accomplish in 2016. So let's continue on, Bill, with what we, you and I were talking about. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, documents. And uh, one of the things, in thinking about uh, tax documents, what are, what are some of your thoughts about, I know you're not a financial guy, but you work with the financial person people all the time. You have a financial guy in your office that helps you with Medicaid and all this stuff, but just some of, some of uh, attorney's general thoughts about tax documents throughout the year so that you're prepared at the end of the year. Okay. What should you retain 
Yeah. Is that? What kind, what kind of stuff should it be doing? You know, as we start 2016, in order to be ready for next December at the end of the year to get to go to the tax people or do our own taxes, what should we really be thinking about? Well, A, that's not really my forte, but I can tell you, you know, some of the things. You, you know, if you're looking for any deductions, you better keep your receipts uh, in proof of, of payment to charities or proof that you expended uh, the funds for those items. Um, obviously, if you're trying to claim certain deductions, you have to be able to prove that you actually did indeed pay for those things. Um, if you have any capital gain or loss, you need to have that information. So if you bought or sold stocks or uh, something like that, you should also keep the uh, information you get on your home mortgage and um, and and things like that. Yeah, I you you bring us uh, giving information on 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 sale of taxes, or sale of stocks. I remember years ago, uh, my broker sold some stocks, and we took a pretty good hit on it. And it was when, uh, uh, but it was a stock that needed to go. But he was he wisely sold it at a time so that I could claim a a. Uh, a deduction on future taxes, and it rolled out over a four-year period. So, you know, it's one of the good reasons for having somebody involved in in your taxes that that understands a little bit more than you do about it. Correct. You you can you can you can make some really dumb moves. And, and if you have an accountant or you use one of the uh, tax preparation services, they have a handout that tells you exactly what you should hold on to. I never, I never even thought of no, that. Yeah, my my accountant always used to send one in the mail saying we need these things. That's prepare good your taxes. That, yeah, it's it's something. It, it is something. I think taxes, it's, and it, and I know. So it, so far we've covered death and taxes, Joe. Do you have any anything that would be uh, more uplifting? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's just talk about this for a second. Bill sends me a site to the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys. And one little tidbit I picked up yesterday off that net, Bill, and here's the title. Where Candidates Stand on Medicare and Health Reform. A critical part of retirement planning is to make sure you have sufficient medical insurance. We know that. One's options will be significantly influenced by our political leaders' positions on how the government should pay for Medicare and health care for retirees over the next few years and decades. This article examines positions taken by the leading 2016 presidential candidates. And there's a site. It didn't darn it, it didn't print out. But if you'll call, I'll tell you what, folks. If you call Kay, don't call her right away. Give me a time to get home and, and get the site to her. If you call Kay at 473-7770, she'll be able to give you the site that you can you can read what the, uh, I didn't realize it didn't print out, what the candidates' but, but positions the, are. But the article's by CBS News Money Watch. Yeah. Okay. It's not, it's, a, it's something that uh, you can, I think you can trust it. Correct. And I think we talk about this, you know, in past episodes of this show, we've talked about seniors really need to pay attention to the politics of seniors, uh, where the money goes, uh, who's doing what, um, you know, with Social Security, Medicare, uh, with uh, Medicaid. And how those dollars get spent, or what clients' positions are. Yeah, because you know, if if I don't know, and you don't know either, who's going to get elected to be the president, next president of the United States? But if uh, a senior population doesn't pay attention to who is elected or what, the, how they might have some kind of an impact on who does get elected, uh, you might truly hurt yourself as far as what your financial position could be. And that's true at the, you know, the federal level and and also at the state and local level too. Yep. 
I mean, you need to be aware of who, who's holding the purse strings on these different programs and what you may be entitled to, what you're giving up by somebody's proposal. Um, and I think most seniors don't really focus on a lot of that. I I know they don't. I know they don't, Bill. Um, we well, used to, you know, we had the silver-haired legislature that uh, Claude Pepper set up that I know you've talked about. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, at one time they used to be the watchdogs of that that arena and uh, really fight for seniors. And um, I think and you don't hear much about it's that. It's gone. It's it's. It's it's a dead deal. It don't, you don't do it anymore. That's one of the reasons that we started that advocacy council for helping seniors. So roughly 40 people worked eight months to survey over 400 people to find out what seniors thought they really needed. And, folks, after an eight-month effort, we put together an eight-page paper, sent it to the commissioners, as a recommendation for something we need to do to start to develop an aging plan for Brevard County. Uh, almost everything we car- we do, Bill, is cost money. Right. You, you don't you don't get away from a cost. But I think sometimes we have to weigh the value of the cost. That's important because I know that uh in a recent battle I had with uh, trying to uh, obtain county funding for our organization, uh, a subject came up in a, a commission meeting that uh, the commissioners uh, started thinking about whether or not nonprofits should get any general tax revenue dollars. Well, you know, that could sound good to people who pay taxes. Yeah, if we, t- we don't, we, yeah. Take the money away from nonprofits and put the money on paving roads. But the half a million dollars that you take away from helping people is not going to pave very much of a road, but it can offset a lot of problems that seniors have if you don't have these programs to help them. And I would agree with that. That's why I think you see, you know, uh, homelessness among seniors soaring. That's just one of the you know indicators that there's not being enough attention paid to that. Now, yeah, that's something that's, that nobody's ever mentioned it before, Bill, on the show. Yeah, uh, the homelessness is, uh, I think, doubled among seniors over the last several years. I've got uh, Rob Crampton, who runs the uh, Housing for Homeless, and John Farrell, who does uh, Daily Bread. Uh, we're taping a show... That'll update. It's called Applied to the Homeless. That'll be the title of it. And that's one of the shows we're going to film next week uh, out uh, at uh, Beth Courtney's Braswell's offices. But uh, these are the types of things that people need to know more about. So there are senior issues we don't well, talk about. I, I would agree with that. And I think we got a bigger problem on the horizon when uh, people my age start retiring. Uh, You know, we've done away with pensions in this country, and most people don't have a pension. Uh, Most people are relying on money. They're supposed to be in the 401K. And I think last time I checked the statistics, something like 75% of 401Ks were underfunded. You know, we took that big economic hit, 2007, 2008, and uh, a lot of people had to go into their 401Ks to to keep their mortgage afloat or uh, keep their households afloat. And subsequently, we have a very underfunded system at this point for retirement. And when uh, people my age get into retirement, you're going to see a lot more people with needs who do not have a pension. Yeah. Uh, I was at a a meeting the other night, folks, and an elderly lady there that runs uh, Grandparents for Children. I think he's, I think that's the name of it. She was telling me that over the last year they had helped over a thousand grandchildren, a thousand, get food. You know, there's something wrong in this country when we have children being born to to men and women 
whether you're going to call them mother or father, whether they're married or however you want to say it. But the kids are there. They still have to be fed. And it should not be the responsibility of the government or the federal schools or the local school system to feed the kids. And, you know, I understand that there's a requirement. I happen to serve at, at the pleasure of the governor on the Children's Services Council. So, you know, I'm an elder advocate, but I also serve with the Children's Services Council. And I see it from both sides. But I also know that if we're wise and smart and put the right kind of programs in place, we can help both segments, both the young and the old, not one to the detriment of the other. And, Bill, you when you when you talk about people your age coming my age, yes, we have a big problem. And because right now, we have folks. This is the honest to goodness truth. You're, you're going to hear. I'm going to. We're going to skip a couple of questions. And Bill and I are going to talk about this. We've got we've got a lot of people that are living on eight nine. Hundred and a thousand dollars, and I can think of one man who is earning thirteen hundred dollars a month. Three hundred forty-six of that is going monthly, just in his insurance costs. So that drops him down to a thousand dollars, and he's got to pay rent. He's got to pay he's got all this stuff: to food, everything else, car. His car is worth a thousand dollars. Yet he couldn't get. Meals on Wheels. Couldn't get it. I have people who who have less income than that. They get four or five hundred dollars a month. They have to survive, pay rent, and survive off of that. And How if do you, do and if and you know, and I always hear from the people, well, there's there's programs set up that can give them, you know, public housing. If you looked at the list of waiting list for all that for elderly uh, people. Everywhere where you can get a subsidized housing for a senior, it, they've got waiting lists. You but, know as well as I do, the long-term care waiting list is something like thirty-eight thousand people. Yes, thirty. Well, last I heard was forty-two thousand, and you know, this year, for the current budget you're in now, the state of Florida put enough new money in there to take care of 400 people on a waiting list of 40,000. See? Additional monies, you mean? Additional money, yeah. yeah. But, Bill, you and I, you and me, we, we're we aware of these facts. And many times when I, and you mentioned it, you said programs available. Most people think that the older American act started by Lyndon Johnson in 1965 takes care of all this. It doesn't. It does it's not. It's so far from taking care of it. It's unbelievable. And we see, yeah, we, we, we go out and uh, Florida Today has a reaching out award fund and you're going to get 1,200 presents and they're going to aging matters to deliver 1,200 presents to, uh, to senior citizens. Yeah, we got senior citizens. They can't even get food. They can't get a meal. They can't eat. We got we got people that can't get transportation to and from a doctor. Oh, by the way, I made a phone call today, and I called the Space Coast Center for Independent Living, and I asked them if they still had the uh, five dollar uh, uh, veterans ride program, and I was informed that all their rides are free now. There's no charge. So, folks, if you need to go someplace, there's a great place to call. And the number is 633-6011. 633-6011. Now, that's only for veterans, though. No, no, no. Uh-uh. Oh. I'm sorry. All of their transportation that's funded by the state and federal government, if you qualify, and the only way you're going to know if you qualify is by calling 633-6011. Tell them what you are, what you need, and they'll ask you certain questions. And if you qualify, you can get a ride. We had a call, got a call at the house a couple of days ago, and there was a place, a, a lady had called, said that uh, I can take a bus to my doctor's office, 
but I have no way to get back to where I live. And the place where the lady is staying, all of a sudden I got thinking, wait, geez, they have a couple of buses there. Why isn't? Why aren't they taking this lady? I made a phone call, and the social worker there thanked me for calling, said she would look into it. Again, it points out, Bill, that most of the time, not always, but most of the time, if we ask the right question, we can help resolve the problem. But knowing how to ask the right question is the real problem. I agree. That's the real problem. That's why I encourage people, if, you, if you're not sure about your legal status, make a phone call. Pick a good attorney. Pick, and to me, a good attorney is an attorney that will give you a free consultation. Well, they also need to know they can call Helping Seniors of Brevard. You okay, know, I, I didn't want to plug that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll plug it for okay. you, but if you want to give out the phone number, because if they don't know where to call, at least we can steer them in the right direction. Folks, but Bill saying that's the organization I started five years ago, Helping Seniors of Bavar, and that phone number I give it all the time is 473-7770. The nice thing about it, Bill, is that when Kay answers the phone, she gets people and they start talking and she picks up on something they say. And one of the big things that Kay picks up on a lot of times is the fact that, uh, let's take a case of an elderly elderly woman or her husband's passed away. Not always, but there's a pretty good chance that the people in their late 80s and early 90s had a spouse that was a serving veteran in World War II. By virtue of the fact that their husband was a serving served in World War II, they are eligible for what's called veterans aid and attendance. And in most cases, it amounts to about an additional $1,400 a month. Well, it's just not World War II, though. It's Korea. Yeah, any veteran. Oh, yeah, any veteran, any yeah. veteran. But mo- I'm, say- I'm talking about this. Yeah, if it's somebody, if you're 60s, 65, 70, and you got a, somebody served in Korea or Vietnam, yes. If they served in time of war like that, you're eligible. And I, I, I don't think most people... As, as long as you didn't get remarried, you have to be the unremarried widow or widower. Yep, yep, yep. But at the same time, there's there are other things that... that's. But you still need to call the VA to ask. You need to get your case out there so, because... It, if you don't qualify under that one program, there might be something else, the statewide Medicaid managed care program. Right. There's, there's, there's so many things out there, folks. But if you don't make that initial phone call, and I've got an article at home on my desk that I probably will run in uh, in a January issue of, of the five newspapers talking about uh, making, a, making a first phone call, the importance of it, and why it's so important to do that. Um, What else, Bill? Well, I would mention, you know, they can call us. There's also the uh, 211 line where they can call and and receive some information. Um, You know, we we do broadcast now outside of Brevard County, so we do have to. That's a good point because if you want to get on this provider network, folks, and, and, you know, if you've got a business or you've got a family member, you know somebody that's a good service type person, call Kay over at 473-7770 and tell them so she can talk to them because where the radio station has quintupled its area of coverage, right now, this signal can be heard. It's a 50,000 watt transmitter and we include most of Indian River County, uh, Indian River County, we're over in uh, Seminole, uh, Orange County, we're all over. We've got all the way up to Jacksonville. So uh, if you've got a business and you want to get involved, this is the place to come get your get your stuff publicized on the airwaves. And I don't care what people say. I still think a lot of people listen to radio, and there's a lot of cars on the road, and doggone it, almost all those cars got their radio going. And even if you're out of our area, call Helping Seniors of Brevard. We will help you find help. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for the plug. And thank you, great folks, for listening. We'll see you next week. Kay will probably do the show. I'll be at a budget meeting for the county.